major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, August 7th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Partiers put on notice. The city is cracking down on a vacation rental that officials say hosted large parties against COVID-19 health orders. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says investigators also found the owner of the Bankers Hill property isn't properly licensed and owes the city money. Many neighbors say the same thing. This unassuming home in Bankers Hill is known for parties. It sounds like dozens of people. There have been nights when there were huge crowds, people roaming the streets. Uh, it was, we felt like we lived in the gas lamp district on a Saturday night. Pam Adler lives across the street from the house that was being advertised as a rental on Airbnb with room for up to a dozen people. This is an inappropriate location. This is a quiet residential neighborhood, lots of seniors, just not the appropriate place for large parties. City attorney Mara Elliott says not only did owners pack the house during the pandemic, they also did a laundry list of illegal modifications. The in-ground pool, jacuzzi, fire pits, two bathrooms, Bathrooms and other projects were all done without permits. In all, more than 20 violations of state and local laws. We're actually shocked, though, that it wasn't just the noise ordinances or the COVID violations, that there were so many other violations. The property was still available to rent on Airbnb as of this afternoon, but the guest capacity has been limited. The listing boasts access to the pool that the city attorney says was illegally put there. Today at the home near 2nd Avenue and Quince Street, a man who said he was there to clean the pool stopped by, saying he was unaware of the alleged violations and was hired just a week ago. San Diego police say since January, they have received 13 calls for service at the Bankers Hill home, all disturbance or party related. Neighbors say they are happy to see the city finally taking action. Oh, excitement. <laughs> we were, all the neighbors came out. Uh, we were very relieved. The city attorney's office also says despite charging $800 per night to rent the place, owner David Curiel failed to pay required taxes and fees to operate the rental. They say he never obtained a business tax license and did not pay the rental unit tax or bills for water and sewer services. In a statement, Elliott said the conduct of the defendants in this case was egregious and no neighborhood should have to put up with such dangerous behavior. She's seeking civil penalties and a permanent injunction against the property owner and the property manager. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. A local private school is suing Governor Newsom over his order banning in-person classes for counties that are on the state's watch list. St. Augustine, an all-boys Catholic high school in North Park, is calling the executive order discriminatory. In a statement released Thursday, the school says it provided in-person summer school and sports with no cases of COVID-19. St. Augustine is scheduled to begin its school year later this month. 30,000 students attend schools in the Chula Vista Elementary School District, and the superintendent wants to see them back in class as soon as possible. The district has spent millions on safety measures, including signage, plexiglass, and sensors that take temperatures and dispense hand sanitizer. They're also partnering with a local company to conduct routine COVID testing. The superintendent says students will return when the county's at a low to medium risk of infection, and only half of the students will return with priority being K through third grade. We want our children to come back because we firmly believe that in-person instruction, it is the best in, uh, type of instruction there is. But of course, we need to come back, back in a very safe manner. Digital learning for students starts August 31st. The district is still offering laptops to those who need them. They've also worked with the city of Chula Vista to distribute over 400 internet hotspots. While digital learning is in place, schools will be used for child care through the YMCA. This is the last day for San Diegans to apply for the city's emergency rental assistance program. KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer tells us the deadline is midnight. 11,000 applications are already in, and 10,000 more are in the process of being submitted. 
but only about 3,500 families will be selected by the lottery to get the help. Azucena Valladolid of the San Diego Housing Commission says there are some priorities for the assistance. Families with children um, under the age of 18 and households that have at least one person with the age of 62 years or older will be prioritized. The remaining applications that meet eligibility will be then sorted and assigned a random number um, to identify the, the progress of which they will be selected for rental assistance. Eight community-based organizations are helping renters complete their applications. One of them is the Chicano Federation. The day that it was announced, our phones have not stopped ringing uh, even today. Uh, so it's been, you know, that just shows the great need that, that we had in the city of San Diego for some kind of rent relief program. Back in June, the San Diego City Council approved $15.1 million in federal CARES Act money to help low-income San Diegans experiencing financial hardship due to COVID-19. But the program is only for the city. This is a huge need across the whole county. Um, you know, it's been really difficult to let folks know that they don't qualify because they live outside of the city of San Diego. And the CARES Act only applies to people in the country legally. A lot of undocumented families, you know, are, are, are unable to get help because this is federal money uh, from the CARES Act. And so, you know, this money cannot go towards uh, families that are undocumented. On the other hand, Valladolid says there are new initiatives from the city of San Diego to fundraise for those who are not selected for the emergency rental assistance program. We've also been initiating and working with the city to try to um, fundraise and increase more funding that's available that can assist additional household members. Tax deductible donations to aid those struggling to pay rent can be made through the San Diego Housing Commission's GoFundMe page. The deadline to apply for the rental assistance program is tonight at midnight. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. A stalemate on Capitol Hill in stimulus negotiations. This as millions of Americans are collecting jobless benefits and the end of the pandemic seems nowhere in sight. Here's Daryl Forges. Stimulus negotiations on the brink of collapse. We've been here uh, now going on two weeks and uh, we still don't have a deal. Friday is the self-imposed deadline for Congress to agree on a new stimulus deal. Democrats and Republicans know we're close to an agreement. Yesterday, I offered to them, we'll take down a trillion if you add a trillion in. They said absolutely not. So Pelosi says you need to come up a trillion dollars. That That's what I heard. Is yeah. that in the cards? I don't think so. As the stimulus talks continue, the latest jobs reports show 1.8 million jobs added in July. Unemployment rate fell to 10.2 percent, but the rate is still higher than the 2009 recession. The White House says the numbers show positive signs. The idea that we won't get a single digit unemployment rate is off the boards now. We're going to see this well into single digits as we move through the summer and fall. The White House still pushing the possibility of President Trump taking executive action on unemployment benefits and eviction protections, even though it's not clear if the president can do so. He will use executive authority to cut the payroll tax uh, for the workforce, which will give them more take home pay and will be an incentive for people out of work to come back to work. I'm Daryl Forges reporting. More than 160,000 Americans have died from the coronavirus. A model from the University of Washington now predicts deaths could hit nearly 300,000 by December. But researchers say 70,000 lives could be saved if everyone wore a mask. Here in San Diego County, three more deaths and 652 new cases were reported today. That high case number was attributed to a backlog of tests reported to the county. California's Health and Human Services Secretary says the glitch causing a lag in collecting coronavirus test information is fixed. Still, it could take up to 48 hours to get the data. Up to 300,000 records may be affected. Dr. Mar Mark Galley says until then, the test state has frozen the data used to calculate county case rates. The metric determines if we can come off the monitoring list. But he and local officials are still talking to agree on how that case rate is calculated. Certainly this period of freezing um, the county data monitoring list and awaiting the backlog to be worked down um, is an important element of that. But we have planned um, conversations with, with San Diego County 
about the data to make sure that we um, not only agree on the number, agree on the metrics and how we, we calculate those. So those important decisions that you're talking about can be made with um, complete agreed on um, calculations and metrics. We get off the monitoring list when our rate reaches 100 cases per 100,000 residents. The county is reporting a slightly lower case rate than the state, although both are still above the threshold. Free COVID testing is coming to essential workers and citizens crossing the border. KPBS health reporter Taryn Mento says the county action comes months after help never arrived from the state and federal governments. Border crossers at the San Ysidro entry will soon have easy access to up to 200 daily COVID tests. The County Health Department's finance chief this week announced the upcoming no appointment site at the pedestrian crossing. This entry is for essential workers and U.S. citizens coming into the United States from Mexico, and our uh, pilot will focus on essential workers. But local hospitals asked federal officials months ago for this kind of help. Scripps Health CEO Chris Van Gorder says back then its South Bay Hospital was filling with COVID patients and at one point almost half reported recent travel from Mexico. We actually were at a peak on May 2nd uh, where it was 47.9%. Van Gorder and Sharp Healthcare had sent a letter asking the federal government for help. A Department of Homeland Security doctor then visited the region, and UC San Diego requested federal and state funding for a formal plan that had county support. But that help never arrived, and now the county's moving forward on its own. And we expect to open the site as early as August 12th. But Van Gorder says the need has lessened now that so much time has passed. I'm a little less alarmed than I was when you know, back in May when we were seeing, you know, close to 50% of the patients in Chula Vista, you know, having crossed the border. You know, that's, that's dropped in almost half. Um, now, again, we could see another spike. He says some resources are already limited and more non-COVID patients are now taking up ICU beds. But he says Scripps and its very tired staff will continue to adjust to the situation. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. The San Diego City Council has rejected a motion to move forward with the terms of a multi-billion dollar energy franchise deal. The motion failed yesterday five to four. It would have determined how the city would begin an auction for a utility to bid for the chance to serve the city's electricity and gas needs. SDG&E's contract expires in January. One of the no votes came from council member Monica Montgomery. She wanted the city to ask for a higher minimum bid than the proposed $62 million. I do feel as a city that we tend to not realize that we have the assets and that the assets belong to the people and that we really at this time need to think uh, a little bit outside of being so conservative the, with the way that we do these things. Um, and I just hope that we can explore that more as a city so that we can get uh, more benefit for the people that we serve. And I don't th think that this will do that. Um, I'm going to vote no, and, and I'm just hoping that we find a better way to, to value what we have. Several city attorneys said that some of the suggestions brought forth need legal review. The council will now have to consider the franchise again after a month long recess. Though the mayor has the authority to set the terms of the deal before then. And San Diego City Council members on Thursday voted to continue investigations into the scandal ridden deal to purchase the building at 101 Ash Street. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the deal has been a money pit for city taxpayers. The city signed a deal to lease and eventually purchase the downtown high-rise in late 2016. Later, the city discovered the building needed a host of renovations, including removing asbestos and replacing the ventilation system. The latest cost estimate for that work is $115 million. The city has so far paid more than $20 million just to rent the vacant building. And as the city's consultant stated, the contract signed with broker Sistera Development leaves no good options for the city. This is a one-sided contract. It protects Sistera in full. And a decision to claim that Sistera committed fraud or that there's some legal method to stop the payments because of a dissatisfaction, which is very understandable about this deal, poses, I think, great legal risks 
to the city. And it's something that I, I would urge the council to be very, very careful about. Eventually, the council and Mayor Kevin Faulkner will have to decide whether to stick with the expensive renovations, try and sell the building at a substantial loss, or somehow try and walk away from the deal. Councilmember Chris Ward said the mayor and city leadership failed taxpayers, but that the city had to continue investigating its options. I don't want to belabor these facts. Obviously, we have to figure out how to move forward, and that's not easy. These are huge numbers. This is an awful situation to be in. But to say it's critical now more than ever to ensure that the council has all the documentation necessary to make a, de a good decision, um, we must have that. Some council members also pushed for a cost-benefit analysis of simply demolishing the building and constructing something new. For now, the city's consultants will continue studying options and come back with more analysis in the fall. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Plans are taking shape for the Mission Valley Stadium site. Mayor Kevin Faulkner posted an image of the signed paperwork to sell the stadium to San Diego State. In the tweet, it read, signed, sealed, delivered, showing the sale is nearly complete. It took 18 months of negotiating since voters passed Measure G back in 2018 to build a new stadium that will serve as a new Mission Valley campus. The $86 million site will include housing, classrooms, and a park, and should be done by fall 2022. And SDSU will not begin any of its fall sports earlier than September 26th because of the ongoing pandemic. The decision follows guidance from the Mountain West Conference Board of Directors who want to further monitor the virus and adjustments to keep student athletes safe. The Aztecs football team will shrink its schedule to 10 games and most other fall sports will only play conference opponents. Meteorologist Kristen Allen back with you. We we're talking about the uh, weather pattern that's really delightful. Some early morning fog to start out the weekend. It will re be replaced by the sunshine. So let's go for a pretty nice weekend. I'd call it a eight or a nine. Tranquil weather overall, despite the marine layer early on, but getting better during the day. So something to look forward to as we press forward. Now, speaking about pressing forward, future forecast shows some of that marine layer pressing in during the nighttime hours, but note most of the southwest here, it has just been dry, not even seeing many monsoonal storms across Arizona. Most of it is pushing further towards the east around New Mexico. So the moisture is really having a hard time getting in across the southwest. And you can see this area, very dry air, just to note that little uh, hiccup there, but still very dry stuff here across California, Southern California. Bakersfield, back to Santa Barbara, LA, Burbank, and San Diego. Relatively speaking, a little bit below the average here for rain amounts. Uh, Santa Barbara especially, but look at San Diego there. Just roughly an inch or so. I would say a little bit less than an inch below. So overall doing okay on the rain gauge here in Southern California. So, uh, you know, always you, you could use a little bit more, but uh, tonight staying dry around San Diego, Chula Vista as well, Oceanside. Back towards Burgos Springs will be right around 73 after pretty hot one. There it is, another hot day for you in the triple digits. As the heat builds this weekend, we'll feel it all across the board. So run right along the coast is where you want to be to stay cool into the mid 70s here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Inland spots a little bit warmer into the middle 80s and then moving over to the mountains where it, it's typically a bit more pleasant here. Numbers are a bit warmer though into the mid and upper 70s and then right down to the desert we go. It's hot stuff right here, 108 on Saturday, 110 by Monday. Reporting for KPBS, I'm Chris Nallen. The coronavirus pandemic is delivering some tough times for the U.S. Postal Service. It lost $2.2 billion over the past three months. Officials warn the losses could top $20 billion over two years, calling the situation dire. Lawmakers are considering a $10 billion bailout to help during this period. Today, the Postmaster General also disputed reports his agency is slowing down mail. Despite any assertions to the contrary, we are not slowing down election mail or any other mail. Instead, we continue to employ a robust and proven process to ensure proper handling of all election mail. 
Earlier this week, the agency said it has the capacity to handle the added volume of mail-in ballots in November's general election. Economic recovery in the U.S. appears to have lost some steam. The jobs report out today shows another 1.8 million jobs were added across the country in July. SDSU's Mira Kopik has more in this Friday business report. The jobs report today showed that unemployment dipped to about 10.2 percent, which is an improvement. Over 1.8 million jobs were added. Most of the jobs were in hospitality and leisure, retail and government. That was about 80 percent of the jobs that were added in, in this month. We still had over 1.2 million people filing unemployment claims. That's new people. So you have 20 weeks in a row where unemployment claims have been over a million during this whole window. And so most economists have said, look, you know what, even though that was a, 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 it beat expectations, the concern is that the pace of growth is going to slow down. Um, because as we start getting into the fall, a lot of those jobs, in particular in hospitality and leisure, uh, may, may, may recede somewhat since many of them are seasonal. So that's a major concern. How does using how does using marijuana affect your ability to work? Well, the answer may surprise you. I spoke with Dr. Jeremy Bernerth, management professor at SDSU, about a new study focused on how pot, whether used before, during, or after work, affects your performance. Dr. Berner, thanks so much for joining me. For this study, you recruited 281 employees and their direct supervisors through social media. Tell us about the parameters of the study and what concerns you were trying to address. We were trying to figure out whether or not cannabis says anything about an employee. So obviously, if you've been paying attention to the news at all over the last two or three years, we know that cannabis and its popularity has really exploded. You know, if you just look at organizations, they're literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars every single year testing applicants, testing employees, and we don't really know if there's a reason for them doing that. I mean, does it make sense? You know, if they're worse employees, then yeah, it would make sense then to screen your applicants. But if employees are using cannabis on the weekend or after work and it's not impacting their work performance, then why would we as organizations or why would we as society outlaw these, this type of use? So what would you say are the benefits of after hours cannabis use in terms of productivity during the workday? What it seems like, you know, if you've had a really stressful day and you go home and maybe use cannabis to help you relax, well, then you're able to get a better night's sleep and you actually wake up the next morning feeling more energized. And so that can then show up in your workplace performance. Now you contrast that with somebody that may be waking up and using cannabis and then they're starting their day with kind of a diminished state of mental capacity or you know they might be distracted that's different but if you're using it after work then maybe it's just helping you relax so doctor would you equate it with de-stressing after a long day with a glass of wine yeah i think that's actually a really good point but unlike, say, using wine or other alcohol where you might have two or three glasses of wine or if you have too many beers and you wake up with a hangover and you don't feel particularly good, and that might show up in your performance, cannabis, and especially you know, some of the participants that were in this study, were using edibles and using them at the end of the night so that they could actually sleep better. And then they actually woke up without the hangover that you might find with alcohol but feeling more energized because you had this really nice night of sleep. If you're using cannabis for the job or while on the job, you know, while you're at work or maybe on your lunch break, that actually negatively affected your performance across several different dimensions as rated by your supervisor. As a social scientist, what surprised you the most? I think the most surprising finding was the fact that after work cannabis use didn't relate to a single form of performance. So we had five different measures of performance, each completed by the supervisor. And if you're just simply using cannabis after work, it did not relate to any of those things, even though, again, you know, we've got these general policies that says, hey, you can't be using these substances whenever. But when you look at the actual, you know, more fine-grained analysis, using it after work didn't relate to any form of performance, none. Like, I, so for me, I mean, I was completely caught off guard by that. You say that organizations are spending billions of dollars each year to counter what they see as a problem. 
Is there a message here for organizations to consider in their policies about substance use during work hours? Yes, I think so. And especially, you know, if employees or applicants start to challenge some of these policies in the court of law, an organization is going to have to actually show, hey, this is a valid requirement of our work. And this study, at least, you know, from an outsider's perspective, might cast some doubt on that. So uh, it definitely would behoove an organization to look at this a little bit more closely. And if nothing else, you know, don't make these overly broad generalizations. Dr. Jeremy Berner, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, unemployment dipped in July, but millions continue to suffer from the pandemic's economic fallout. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. And we have breaking news. The La Mesa Police Department now says the officer involved in a controversial arrest is no longer with the department. The statement released said simply that Matt Dodge is no longer employed. It's not clear how he came to leave the La Mesa PD. Charges have been dismissed against the man who was arrested, Amari Johnson. He's now suing the city of La Mesa and the former officer. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you.